Well, hey everybody, Mike Griffith here. Welcome to tonight's Ingles on the Beat segment. I always hit the start button, I think, before I'm really ready. Um, I kind of like going off the top of my head, kind of just giving you a feel for what I really think about things going on. And we're going to do more of that tonight. Um, obviously, these are still pretty trying times for all of us. We're all getting used to uh, covering George. I was just talking to a buddy of mine who works for the Zaxby's. You know, Zaxby's is based there in Oconee County, right near Athens. And just talking with one of their leaders about how their company is dealing with that. And obviously, you know, that's a, that's a local business. I'll tell you another company, though, that I think is dealing with this really well uh, is uh, is Ingalls. Ingalls, and certainly they're our sponsor, the Ingalls on the Beat segment. And I got some information today. Um, you know, Ingalls right now, this is an opportunity. They're doing some hiring Long-term and short-term positions are available at your local Ingles. You need to check this out. They're doing interviews on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, you can go to Ingles' website online and click Applications, go to Careers, and you can apply for a job at Ingles. So, you know, um, I've got a daughter. She's, she's a manager uh, at, at a grocery store out, out of state. Um, you know, she's out there working and, and there's people right now they need to take care of the community and certainly your local neighborhood Ingles uh, has done that for you. The, all the stores right now, the Ingles open from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, the first hour shopping, 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. on Tuesdays and Wednesdays is for the senior shoppers and for those with the compromised immune system. So uh, some news from Ingles and, and I'll go back and I'll repeat all that information again. But if you're interested in a job or career right now, Ingalls does have short-term and long-term positions available, and you can go online and, and check that out on the Ingalls website. So, um, again, we'll talk more about Ingalls later in the show. Very important um, to have a local neighborhood store like Ingalls that takes care of the community like they have for so long. Um, Georgia football, right? So today was kind of interesting. I started the day with a story on Justin Robinson, one of the incoming freshman receivers, and more than ever, now more than ever, being an early enrollee, think about that advantage. I think one of the net effects, and we've talked about different net effects, uh, unintended consequences, whatever you want to call it, um, on the last few shows I've done, and I've had some theories about it, right? Like I've said, I think that in-state recruiting will pick up and be more important. I think this is kind of an eye-opener for, for a lot of parents. Maybe they don't want their kids to be so far away out of state. So I think you're going to see as a result of this, Georgia, with more in-state recruiting. Justin Robinson, one of those in-state recruits, right? Georgia already with four commitments in 2020-21 um, that are all from the state of Georgia. Well, now Justin's on campus, and uh, you know he went to a smaller school, Eagles Landing, it's 1A. This guy is 6'4", 220. And he was a big-time priority for Cortez Hankton. Georgia wanted to get one of these young guys on campus. Now, they didn't go through spring football. But just him being around those other players, learning how to take care of himself, being at the training table, Terrence Edwards tells me he gained 10 pounds in his time on campus. So you're talking about a guy of Lawrence Cager size here. Now, he's young, and he's not as polished as Lawrence was when he came to to Georgia uh, from Miami, but this is that kind of target uh, for whoever's at quarterback. You know, you got a 6'4", 220 guy that runs a 4'5", 340. Um, that's pretty doggone impressive, and that's who Justin Robinson is, a guy that is still working out with Terrence Edwards, an impact player. So I got to thinking more about it, you know, why it was so important for Justin Robinson to be on campus. Well, think about all the other guys. Uh, that have been on campus early. I mean, Carson Beck competing at quarterback. No way he could have come in later and been able to compete at quarterback. But because he's already on campus, that, that's going to make a difference. Major Burns, uh, the defensive back from Baton Rouge, another guy on campus. Kendall Milton, a lot of excitement for Kendall Milton. Kendall already in the 225 range, I'm told. Um, now, the question about Kendall Milton is, and really, I got questions about the whole backfield. So, I guess I might as well just dive into that. Um, i got questions about the backfield because I'm not sure about the offense. Now, I do believe that Jamie Newman's going to be the guy. So let me start, let me preface the conversation with Georgia having a graduate transfer quarterback that runs read option RPO. 
Last year, Jamie Newman carried like one out of every five plays. Now, he's not going to carry that much at Georgia. It's going to be a little bit more of a pro style. That's why he came to Georgia, because he wants to play in a pro style offense so that he can be prepared for the NFL. That, that just makes sense. And, and Georgia wants a more mobile quarterback. So everybody kind of gets what they want here, right? So, so much of the offense is going to be built around Jamie Newman, RPOs. So what's going to happen to the running back position? Well, it's, it's Kirby Smart, and Kirby's always going to run the ball. I think where Kendall has an advantage is being that big guy at 225, that downhill guy. But here's the question. He played his high school football in Fresno, California. That's good football. It's not great football. It's not Metro Atlanta. It's not South Florida. It's not Texas. And if you look at a lot of Kendall's film, he's running over and running away from guys that are a lot smaller than him. Now, I don't know what's going to happen when they put the pads on, but that's going to be question number one for Kendall Milton. How does he handle himself physically against the speed and power that he's going to see in the SEC? And, and he'll have no better, no better test for that than going against George. Monty Rice is going to be waiting for him, right? N'Kobe Dean's going to be waiting for him. Aziz Ajilari will welcome him. Jordan Davis will land on him. There will be some scrimmage hits. Um, so Kendall Milton will learn early on how he handles the physicality of the game. And then you also have to ask, what is Todd Munkin and Matt Luke, who I believe are working in concert with the offense, what are they going to ask the running back to do? Nobody's going to come in, and, and let's just be realistic, nobody's going to come in and be DeAndre Swift. There's not a running back on this roster that is going to be what DeAndre Swift was last year when he was healthy. DeAndre Swift is as good and as versatile of a running back as there was in college football last season. That's why he's the first projected back off the board. I mean, watching Swift play, uh, you know, he was dynamic. He was a home run hitter. Had he gotten better blocking downfield like he had the year before, you'd have seen a lot more 40 to 70 yard runs from DeAndre Swift last year. I thought the tight ends, I thought Eli Wolf and Charlie Warner did a really nice job. I did not think the receivers did as good a job, particularly after Lawrence Cager was out of the lineup. Uh, but getting back to the point, what are the running backs going to be asked to do? In my mind, like, and I think we all have an idea of what we think it's going to be like, right? We, none of us know for sure because Todd Munkin doesn't know for sure. He's got to see what the talent can do, what the talent dictates. And, I mean, look, if Kendall Milton is back there and he looks like Eric Dickerson, it, the game plan is going to be a little different. But I'm not even sure Kendall Milton's one of the top two or three backs right now. Uh, you know, Kenny McIntosh is a talented guy. Zamir White is an, is an incredibly talented guy. James Cook is going to be over 200 pounds. Talented guy. He was, he was one of the top two or three running backs two years ago. And now, you know, he's two years into the program. And they're all working out in South Florida. So, so don't want to put too much pressure on Kendall Milton. But at the same time... You know, like Jeff Centel says, I mean, the guy looks like Captain America. I mean, he's huge. He's 6'2", 225. So there's all sorts of different dynamics in that backfield. You know, look, we know that Zamir White, I mean, he's a bull in a china shop, man. Zamir hits the line at 100 miles an hour. He's powerful. He's worked hard. He's hungry. You, you kind of have that, I, I hate to throw the comparisons out there, but People talk about Nick Chubb in the same sentence because I guess because you know because Chubb came but Chubb, Chubb was bigger though but Zamir is so powerful and we've seen it in some of those videos I remember last fall when I was doing those video stories remember when the Georgia football team would put up a video on Twitter and I would I would do a story and ID all these different hits and he's just powering over linebackers so you got Zamir but how does he catch the ball right so is he is he a three down back I don't think so. Um, unless he really improves his catch, pest catching abilities, Zamir's, you know, Kenny McIntosh, I thought looked outstanding. I think he's the best all around back. I think he goes between the tackles. I think he's got the cutback. I think he's got the hands. So there's Kenny McIntosh. James Cook, this is year three for James Cook. The teammates can't say enough about James Cook, but it just didn't seem like, and I'm not a critic of James Coley, I want to be clear on this. But it just didn't seem like Georgia figured out the best use for James Cook last year. I kept waiting to see a James Cook package. I kept waiting to see him explode on the scene. 
and, and be that fifth dimension that, that the offense was needing. You know, at the end of the year, I said, could he be the answer when they needed a spark uh, after Cager went out and DeAndre got hurt? Could Cook, you know, it, it just never really materialized for James Cook. And yet, when you talk to the Georgia football players, he's a guy they all can't stop talking about. He's fast. He moves different. I mean, they make him sound like he's the invisible man, like you can't get a grip on this guy. So I'm still holding out hope. Uh, obviously, his older brother, Dalvin Cook, one of the best running backs in the NFL. Um, you say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Okay, that's not the dad, but that's the brother. And Dalvin was a guy, by the way, who got bigger in college. So, you got James Cook also. So before we start putting all this on Kendall Milton, remember, there are some very talented guys that have been in the program, that have taken those hits, that know about the SEC level of speed. Um, so I'm not a doubter. I'm just saying that the smart money goes with experience typically. Now, Kendall Milton, he may beat the curve. But without spring drills, that's going to hurt him. That's going to hurt him. Um, now, he is going to be further along than the other incoming players um, that, that didn't go through uh, spring drills. I mean, Dejan Edwards, the kid out of Moultrie, Georgia, Colquitt County, that powerhouse down there. Now, I've actually heard some people say they think – uh, that Edwards may be a better fit for the future of the offense. Again, everybody's speculating on the offense. So what do I think about the offense? Um, RPO, running quarterback, whether uh, I think Jamie Newman's the guy, and then I think, I think you'll see Dwan Mathis and Carson Beck play. I think you'll see both of them play. I think Georgia will play a lot of quarterbacks. Um, Jamie's the guy, in my opinion, uh, even more so now without spring because he has so much more experience, uh, because he is full-grown man. Um, I think this helps the returning players. And say this too, Broderick Jones not being here, uh, a guy that a lot of people projected at, outside, at, at left tackle. Kirby Smart told us on signing day, hey, look, I'm not going to think these offensive tackles are going to come into fall camp and win jobs. I think that's even more so true now without spring football. And I think Georgia will be fine, by the way. Jamari Sellier is solid. Um, you know, you, you know about Trey Hill. Uh, ben Cleveland, you got a whole big Ben's on the comeback trail there after what, whatever sidelined him for the bowl game. Um, you know, Erickson played in the bowl game. He played well. Matt Luke's got a lot of talent there to work with, even if the young guys like Ratledge and Jones uh, are a little bit further along, but behind than they would have been. Because now used to be you go through spring and all the returners returning guys and all the early enrollees they get this big jump and the coaches get a really good idea what they can do and then when fall comes august camp comes the young guys come in and they get a lot of attention because the coaches kind of have an idea okay we know what we got let's see how these new guys can impact now you don't have spring right so you've got to do some of the things in the spring some of the things you would have done in the spring, you got to do in the fall, namely hit, chiefly hit. Usually spring drills, there's a lot of contact. Those spring scrimmages are some knockdown, drag out, physical affairs. I don't think you can do that every week in the fall, but I think you'll do it. I think Kirby will do it one weekend. I do. I think there's going to be some hitting. Uh, I don't think the quarterbacks are going to get hit, but I think you're going to see the running backs get hit. Um, there, there's going to be some scrimmage action, right? You got to separate. You got to find out real early about those young guys, but you got to find out about the returners too now, uh, because that window for evaluation is shrinking. You're also building your offense. You got to find out how quickly Jamie Newman, uh, Dwan Mathis, and Carson Beck, uh, how quickly are they able to pick up the offense? You've got to simplify. We knew they were going to simplify. Um, so getting to where I think the offense is going to be, I think you're going to see more of a West Coast look. Um, and what I mean by that is high percentage passage out of the backfield, short routes, control pass game, out of the RPO look, uh, Jamie Newman essentially running an option or he can step back, he can fire short, or maybe instead of running the read option, he just steps back and fires into the flats, and there's James Cook in the slot on one side, right, or Kyrus Jackson on the other. And, and it stretches these defense out wide so that when you do come at them up the middle, uh, with a Zamir White, with a Kenny McIntosh, with a uh, you know James, you know who knows Kendall Milton. The defense is spread out. Part of what happened last year to the Georgia offense was they were not able to stretch the field out, uh, they, especially vertically. They weren't able to beat press coverage with those young receivers. Now Cager could do it, 
But when KJ was gone, that that was the whole key to Jake Fromm being 70% passer with KJ on the field and less than 50% with KJ off the field. Having a guy that could get open against press coverage. Pickens got a lot of attention. He got a lot of double teams, had a lot of safeties you know, that were shading his side of the field. He's going to continue to get attention. You've got to find receiver two and three that can beat that press coverage. Matt Landers has to arrive. He has to arrive. Kyrus Jackson's a tough guy, but he's got to catch the football. Uh, Kyrus came back from the hand injury. He had a soft cast on. He was not able to catch the football. Okay, Kyrus Jackson this year, I believe, could be an impact player. He's a guy that Kirby has already tagged with some leadership responsibilities. Uh, I expect Kyrus Jackson to be in the mix. How soon will Dominic Blaylock be back from the knee injury? Um, I don't think it's realistic to think that Dom is going to be 100% in August. Typically, it takes over a year physically and mentally. Like, physically you get back, but even mentally. Like, you saw that, I thought, with Zamir White last year. You know, Zamir was back physically, but mentally, I didn't think I really got a good look at who Zamir was until the Sugar Bowl. In regular season, he just it, it, it didn't look like he had any vision. It looked like he, it was very north and south. It didn't look like he cut real well off blocks. Like maybe he wasn't quite ready to test the knees. But I thought in the Sugar Bowl we saw a little bit more of that. That made me optimistic um, that Zamir could compete. I thought Kenny McIntosh looked great all year. Um, a guy that played special teams. Uh, you know, a guy that, you know, Sony Michelle, you know, Kenny Mack, you know, both South Florida guys. I just, if he wore the number 26, right? Um, he's wearing the six right now. I know his dad's talked to him about that number. Those single digits on backs, I don't know about you, but I'm just like, that's high school recruiting stuff, right? You get a double digit. You get a man's number. You get a double digit number on you, right? Um, that's that's what I like myself personally. So um, let me go to, let me take a look. Uh, I want to cover one more thing before I take questions. I did a story tonight on Mel Kuyper Jr. did some position rankings and all of this stuff is conjecture, okay? If you think for a second, and I got a lot of respect for Mel Kuyper Jr. I've met him several times when I've gone to the Senior Bowl or at the Combine. He is a great guy. He, first of all, I just want to tell you he is a great human being. He is as well-connected as it gets. He's as well-liked. He's as well-respected. But at the end of the day, nobody's picking up the phone and getting straight dirt from an NFL team. It's not going to happen. I've had good friends who work for NFL teams, and they have steered me in a direction early. But when push comes to shove, they will not tell you what their board looks like. They absolutely will not tell you who they like. In fact, some teams will go so far as to try to mislead. It happened with Randy Moss. Do a Google on it. Find out how the Vikings got Randy Moss so late in the draft. They will do everything they can to lower the stock of somebody they're very interested in. I think some of that was happening with DeAndre Swift recently. I'd seen some mocks, and I wrote about it last night, where Swift had fallen out of the first round, and I'm just going, you know, I just don't buy this. And I get it that DeAndre's had some durability issues, but, but what running back doesn't anymore, right? Nobody has a long shelf life at running back, it seems like, anymore. Um, you know, Todd Gurley, you know, how much does he have left in the tank, and how old is he, right? So I think there was a little bit of that going on. Kuiper came back with DeAndre projected in the first round at number 18, the Miami Dolphins. I believe, that's, I believe that's a good number. I could see him going to the Dolphins at 18, and I think they've got 26. Uh, Andrew Thomas, first Georgia guy. He will be the first Georgia guy off the board because of the demand for offensive tackles. He may only be the fourth offensive tackle taken and yet still projected in the first half of the first round. So, kids, you want to make a lot of money? If you're not a quarterback, be an offensive tackle. Because the demand is through the roof. Um, and good for Andrew Thomas uh, and good for Isaiah Wilson. Um, another guy you're seeing projected second, third round. But, but getting to the position rankings, I was a little surprised that Jake Fromm is now ranked as the number seven quarterback. Do we really believe that Jalen Hurts is going to be a better NFL quarterback than Jake Fromm? I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I'm going to tell you why. I think he's got a good arm. Hurts, we're talking about. He has some mobility, um, but I don't think I, I I don't see him running an offense in the NFL. And again, I could be wrong. I don't think he's Kyler Murray. Murray, I'll put it like that. And I don't think a team's going to draft him high enough to build an offense around him. 
part of the attraction for Jake Fromm and for any good drop back quarterback, and what makes a good drop back quarterback is the pre snap read. And as Jake said, get rid of the ball before you get in trouble, right? That prolongs your career. There's two different directions that NFL teams are going in right now. They're, they're going with the mobile quarterback and they're going with the drop back quarterback. In a perfect world, you get a guy with some mobility, you know, that, that has, you know, the, the Jake computer chip. I mean, Jake's got a computer chip. That's why they like him. He is that good. He is that processor. He does get through progressions quickly. He is typically very accurate. The arm strength has been challenged. There are some questions about that, but there were some questions about Kirk Cousins in the same way. A guy like Jake can last a long time. Uh, a guy like Jake would be very valuable to have, even as your two. And you better have a good two. Um, I think Jake would be a good fit for the New Orleans Saints. I've seen him projected to the Jaguars. I don't know if I'm buying that. Uh, but Jake Fromm is the seventh quarterback. I'm, I'm going to say I don't buy it. I'm, I'm going to you know buy or sell, right? I'm selling on that. I'm not believing that Jake is the number seven quarterback. All it takes is one team to like him. I'm going to throw it out there. A guy that I interviewed twice uh, at, a, at a charity golf tournament was Bruce Arians. Loves Jake Fromm. Loves Jake Fromm. Don't be surprised if the Tampa Bay Buccaneers don't draft Jake Fromm in the second or third round and he ends up the backup to Tom Brady. Think about that. Brady is the prototypical drop back guy. Jake Fromm is a, is a prototypical drop back guy. Not saying he's going to be Tom Brady, okay? He's not. Jake's not going to win six Super Bowls, okay? I don't think he's cut from that cloth, but I do think he's a capable backup, and I do think Tampa Bay would be a team that would be a good fit, as would New Orleans, in my opinion. The other player rating that surprised me was J.R. Reed being outside the top 10 at safety. I don't know what happened with J.R. Reed, but something did, okay? Because as a junior, uh, there were bowl there were bowl games, all star games that were interested in J.R. He was looked at as like a third or a fourth round pick. Now I'm not sure what happened, but his stock has dropped. He had a good combine. Uh, he was explosive. Um, he had a, a, a phenomenal long jump. I thought he interviewed well. Uh, the feedback I got on J.R. has been solid. Um, but I think there's some question about his athleticism. and uh, But I also think that out of the top 10 is too low. I still think J.R. Reed will be one of the top 10 safeties picked. And I, I, I wrote this story. You know, people go, well, what? how do you know it's a, you know, uh, dog bites man, not news, right? Man bites dog news. J.R. Reed not being in the top 10 of the safeties, that's uh, man bites dog. That's news to me because J.R. is a captain. He's a leader. He's a great open field tackler. I thought he played the ball well. I thought he was good in coverage. I thought he was good against the run. Um, maybe this puts the chip on his shoulder that maybe he gets kind of a little bit of an edge back. I don't want to say he didn't have an edge last year, but I felt like you know Jay Jr. was more of a traffic cop back there. He didn't maybe make as many plays as you might have thought, um, but he made sure Georgia didn't get beat deep. He was very sound. He's a pro. I thought he conducted himself like a pro. Um, so those were some of the position rankings that kind of threw me for a loop. I wrote about that on Dog Nation. Um, you can check that out as well. Now, go to your questions. Um, apologize, I haven't been looking at the comments. I've just been running my mouth here uh, on the Ingles on the Beat segment. Um, I want the reminder for those that weren't there at the start of the program, um, this is Ingles on the Beat. It comes to you every Tuesday. They're my sponsor. I appreciate Ingles. Um, they're your neighborhood grocery store. And Ingalls will be doing some hiring for both short-term and long-term positions. Every Tuesday and Thursday, 2 to 4, uh, is when they're going to be conducting interviews. To apply, though, to get set up, if you're interested in one of these jobs, and you could be, you could be interviewing for it by Thursday, go to the Ingalls website, uh, go online under careers, and uh, you can get an application and apply. And, and perhaps get a job short-term, long-term, interviews Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, all Ingalls locations open 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. And for the seniors and those who have some risk factors, health risk factors, the shopping from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. will be dedicated to those folks um, to protect those folks and take care of you at your local uh, neighborhood Ingalls. Uh, now, to your questions as I go to our Dog Nation Facebook page. Um, I probably go to this page 100 times a day, um, whether I'm watching Dog Nation Daily with Brandon Adams 
uh, whether I'm reading Connor Riley's stories, I thought Connor had a really nice piece up on Matt Luke right now. Certainly Centel's Intel. If you have any interest in Georgia recruiting, Jeff does a phenomenal job with, with that. Um, so here's your questions. Where are we at here? Oh, we're talking about William Gleet, and I like this. Would you rather be a third-string quarterback or a third-string catcher in Major League Baseball? I want to be the second string because third-string guys get cut, and every time they change coordinators, the coordinator brings like a guy from his last team, and the third-string quarterback gets cut, and I saw this happen here. Drew Roman says Tampa Bay is going to draft Andrew Thomas and Isaiah Wilson. Uh, one, one maybe. Um, wouldn't that be great for Andrew Thomas to work for Tom Brady, to have a, a, the consummate pro to break him in? And you just know that Brady would love a guy like Andrew Thomas. Really, every quarterback is going to love a guy like Andrew Thomas. Such a first-class guy all the way around, team captain. Um, all right, so what do we got here? Uh, Travis McCullough, wish we had an Ingles here. Uh, you could use a second shot. Well, you can't commute. I'm sure there's one within 15 or 20 minutes away. It's not that bad. George does a pretty good job with their roads. I know everybody complains about their roads, but having lived all over the southeast, Georgia does a pretty good job uh, with their roads. Uh, let's see, what other questions uh, do we have here? Drew Roman, what's up with Clay Webb? Nothing that I know of. Um, as far as I know, he's still on the team. He'll be competing for a spot. Um, don't have any updates there. You know, did you see the deal with Trevor Lawrence earlier today? This was kind of a talker. Trevor Lawrence and his girlfriend started a GoFundMe um, to help the, um, you know, the coronavirus patients. And it was like, oh, the NCAA shut it down. Well, the NCAA didn't shut it down, but Clemson did because Clemson was like, wait a minute, you know, uh, is this a potential compliance? So Clemson did the right thing and making sure that they didn't have a potential compliance issue. Can you imagine if Trevor Lawrence wasn't eligible for the first three games of the season or, or something to that effect because of some mess up like this? Um, so the NCAA has come back and have said that, and here's the quote, the NCAA did not ask Clemson student athlete Trevor Lawrence to take down his fundraiser for COVID-19 patients. We continue to work with member schools so they have the flexibility to ensure the student athletes and communities impacted by this illness are supported. And we applaud Trevor for his efforts. So good news, it appears that uh, Trevor Lawrence's GoFundMe for the coronavirus uh, back on again. And anytime you can generate money, uh, for this global pandemic, that's a good thing if you can help people out. Uh, William, you've asked me a couple times about Tommy Bush and where does he fit in, and that's up to him. You know, Tommy had a tough year last year. He had the sports hernia surgery. Uh, he was out most of the year. I think he was practicing by the end of the year. You may have seen he's done some workout videos. He's a tall, lanky guy. Uh, I think he has good hands. Where is he at on the separation, the explosion? What's he done in the weight room? Those aren't questions that I can answer but he will absolutely have an opportunity to compete. You know, Kirby doesn't run these guys off. If, if he gives you a scholarship, it's because he believes in you and he wants you to come in and compete, but it's up to you to take advantage. Sometimes guys get injured. Uh, it happened with Demetrius Robertson. You know, that's why D-Rob hasn't been the guy that maybe we projected because he was injured coming in. He didn't have a healthy season. So 2018, he didn't get a lot of playing time. And then last year, he had that hamstring early. And I don't know how many of you have ever had a hamstring injury. Uh, I didn't have one until like year 38 in life in, a, in, in one of my men's league softball. And I played ball all my life, right? I'm, I'm a ball for life kind of guy. But when that hamstring went, when I was trying to stretch that single into a double, life changed. Life has still changed. You pop a hamstring once, and it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard for the brain to get the body to go there again all out because you remember. I mean, it feels like, I mean, I don't want to make light of people to get shot, but that's what it feels like. I mean, I don't know who's pulled a hamstring out there, but it's bad. It's really bad. So D-Rob went through that early last season. I didn't think he was ever 100%. You'd see him on those jet sweeps. He didn't look, I mean, now he was fast relative to me and you and, and really relative to most people. But he didn't look like that elite freshman that he was at Cal. He didn't have that gear. He hasn't had that gear at Georgia. Maybe he did in some early practices. But after that hamstring went, he was not the same guy. He was not. The, and he played. He got better. He got capable. He did well enough. But he was not dynamic. He was not dynamic. And maybe there's no guarantee he'll get back to dynamic. 
because hamstrings can linger if you don't let them rest. And it's a very difficult injury to get over physically and mentally. Injuries are hard to get over. Um, very difficult. Uh, let's see here. What else we got here? Do I think Hazelwood will come back to UGA, Drew? Uh, does he have the opportunity? I mean, a lot of other guys signed with Georgia. Um, I, I'm not sure that, that Hazelwood has the opportunity. I, I don't know that there's a scholarship waiting for him here. Um, I, I don't know that there's not. I'm not going to say there's not, but you know, I look at the receivers room and I look at the guys coming back, and then I see four incoming freshmen that signed on, uh, looking to compete. Um, I, you know, I, I, I never say never, okay? But I just wouldn't make that assumption. Um, you know, that, that that's just automatically there because there's guys that have wanted to be here from the jump that came here that invested. And, you know, that would be a decision for Coach Smart and Coach Hankton and, and Todd Munkin and, and an area of need and, and how would that tie in with the other guys that you've got lined up to compete at the position. So I don't know. Uh, Eric Benford, does Robert Beal contribute this year? Again, that's up to Robert Beal. There's a lot of competition at these positions. Um, we know that Beal didn't. I think he kind of went in the transfer portal for right, and then he, and then he pulled back out right. Um, that doesn't mean that he won't contribute. That doesn't mean anybody's going to hold anything against him. They won't. Um, if he didn't, you know, if they didn't want him here, he'd know that. Uh, but you're at a very competitive position with Monty Rice, uh, Nicobe Dean. I think those guys are going to be running first team. Quay Walker, a pretty impressive guy as well. Um, talent coming in, um, you know, in the signing class as well. So. Uh, does he contribute? Uh, well, you know that that's that's up to him. Um, let, let's see how he works out. Let's see what his off season's like. Right now is an opportunity for a lot of these guys, though. Uh, the the old, you know, it's what you're doing when nobody's watching. You've heard that from coaches before. That truly takes effect right now uh, with everybody at home training. I, I did a story this morning on Monty Rice. Of all people, Monty Rice with the selfie video. And I got to tell you, I'll tell you the little story about Monty. Um, Monty Rice here. So Monty is a great interview when he decides to talk. Monty does not always like to talk to the media because Monty is a no-nonsense guy. So here's what I mean by that. So sometimes you ask a player a question and the Georgia guys do a really nice job of representing their school. They do a very good job of making sure they say the right things. And and, and that's part of the job, right? I mean, Jake Fromm has been the consummate spokesperson. I mean, if State Farm doesn't hire Jake Fromm, they're missing the boat because, you know, the guy looks like a model, he's articulate, and he's Jake from State Farm. It just makes sense. He'd be an incredible spokesperson. You don't have to worry about the character. He's even won the, the other insurance company's student athlete award, Allstate. So, um, but Jake was always good at saying the right thing. Now, Monty can say the right thing, but he sometimes doesn't want to just say He wants to tell you what he really thinks. And sometimes saying what you really think can get you in trouble. And Monty will tell you what he really thinks. Um, and so I think Kirby kept sending. So last year, there was, I don't know, Monty was sent, supposed to talk to the media five or six times. He only showed up three or four. And I think that's because Monty knew that Maybe he didn't want to say what everybody wanted to hear after the South Carolina game, right? Maybe he had some strong feelings. But I think Kirby wanted Monty out there. And, and I had this talk with Monty later in the year. I, 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 had, I pulled him aside. I said, listen, Monty, you are great in interviews when you want to be. I mean, when you want – I said, but I get the feeling that sometimes you don't want to just say what you – he goes, man, I, I, I don't want to play games. That Monty is not a game player. This is why he's universally respected in the locker room. He is not a guy that plays games. He is a no-nonsense guy. I said, did you ever think that maybe the reason Kirby keeps sending you out there is he wants you to say some of those tough things? Because everything Kirby does is calculated. I think he wanted Monty to say some tough love things, just like DeAndre Swift did last year. Remember when DeAndre Swift came out after the South Carolina game and he kind of called some things out and he kind of went, whoa, DeAndre Swift putting it on the table, right? Kirby wanted that. All right, and I think we're going to hear and see more of that from Monty Rice this year, and I'm looking forward to it because Monty is a really intelligent guy. Um, he speaks from the heart, and he's a leader. And he recently did a video where he called out his other teammates. Uh, who do you call it? Tyson Campbell, Aziz Ajilari, um, 
Malik Herring, he called them out to make workout videos. I mean, that was the most money thing ever to call out teammates in a video. Um, so that, to me, that was a healthy thing. It was part of the quote-unquote invisible progress that I believe George is making in this offseason. So um, that, that's Monty Rice. Uh, what else we got here? Uh, let's see. Uh, apologies for the grammar. Uh, happy hour to blame William A. Have fun. Joseph Kennedy, you're right. Monty is a real deal. I think Monty is, is going to have a really special year. Looking forward to him. Uh, you know, Joseph Kennedy talking about Jamie Newman. We talked about Jamie a lot earlier. I um, want to make sure I, I hit on all, touch on all the points. If you have any other questions for me, uh, what else you want to talk about? You know, what else is on your mind? I hope that you all are doing the social distancing thing. Um, in my conversation with a buddy earlier tonight, we were saying, well, what are they going to do for football games? Uh, are they going to only sell one out of every four tickets? Are they going to make sure that everybody's still... I just said, if we can just all get on board right now and do the social distancing, then maybe... We won't have any restrictions by August. Maybe it's game on. Maybe it's sold out stadiums. That's kind of what I'm hoping for. Excuse me, the first week of September. If we can all wrap our arms around it uh, right now and practice the social distancing and be responsible, then down the road we won't have to, what is it, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So um, that's kind of my thoughts on that. Uh, Darnell Washington, interesting, okay. So Darnell Washington, uh, super freak, all right, 6'7", 260 tight end uh, out of Las Vegas. I've talked to people that say this could be the best tight end prospect in 10 years. That seems like a lot to say. That seems like a lot of pressure. I wouldn't want to put that pressure on anyone. Um, if he's that good, they're going to get him the ball. If he's that good, they're going to get him the ball. If you want to know what the offense is going to look like, then you need to know who the best players are. Because it's real simple. It's real simple when you're an offensive coordinator. Who are the best players? Put the ball in their hands. It's real simple. It's Really, it's that simple. If he's one of the best guys, one of the best targets that gets open, that makes yards after the catch, then you'll see him on the field, right? Uh, just like running backs. You know, There was a reason in 2017 that Georgia had the highest run-pass ratio of any non-option team in the country because you had Nick Chubb and Sonny Michelle and DeAndre Swift. You think? You think you're going to run the ball? Um, so it comes down to who your playmakers are. So when you're asking me, how are these guys going to do, and they're great questions, and they're the same questions that I have, but that's up to them. That's up to Marcus Roseme. Uh, that's up to Darnell Washington. That's up to Jermaine Burton. Um, that's up to Justin Robinson. It's up to Matt Landers. It's up to Kiaris Jackson. It's up to D-Rob. It's, it's up to Kenny McIntosh. It's up to Desimir White. Are you going to do the things that are going to make you better? And if you're the best guy, then you're going to get the ball in your hands. And if you're not, you're not. And you're going to line up and you're going to compete. And you're going to try and contribute in other ways. And, you, and you're going to show your wares on special teams. Because, oh, by the way, that's an area that's going to make a big jump. Nothing against Scout Fountain, okay? But Cochran, special teams, and all this talent that Georgia has, let me tell you. The special teams unit will make the biggest jump of all the units. You're going to see a return game that you haven't seen since McCole Hardman. It's only been a couple of years, but eventually teams stop kicking to McCole, right? You're going to see some dynamics in those special teams with Scott Cochran. I, I can guarantee you that. There's a reason that Kirby hired this guy, and if he wasn't already motivated enough, the fact that Nick Saban uh, wouldn't give him that opportunity, are you kidding me? How many of you have been told that you couldn't do something? Right? Raise your hand, right? Me? The, whoever told you that you couldn't do it, when you had an opportunity to prove you could do it, what'd you do? Right? I think about that. That's what I think about. I think about when I was told I couldn't do something. Let me tell you, I came back on those people. You tell me I can't do something, not only am I going to dig deeper, but you're going to be one of the first people that I'm going to show what I can do. And Cochran has got something to prove. Because Saban had him on staff for how many years? 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. What, is that 13 years? And the guy still won't give you the promotion? The guy doesn't have any faith that you can coach special teams. With all the turnover that Alabama's had in 13 years, you're telling me 
that Nick Saban didn't have an opportunity to give Cochran a, a, a job, doing what he wanted as a position coach, letting him recruit. I mean, let's be real here. Scott Cochran arrives at Georgia with his hair on fire, with something to prove. And this guy is going to be infectious. This guy is going to be a motivator. Uh, he's going to bring the energy. Um, an absolute dynamic hire, ingenious hire by Kirby Smart. And he, no, he didn't do it to hurt Alabama. He did it to help his staff. Kirby weighed this. Kirby knows the guy. He worked with him. And Kirby, you know what? He gave him a chance. He gave him a chance. So I like that hire. Special teams is going to jump. If some of these guys you're talking about, if I say, well, I don't think this guy um, you know, is going to make it, he may prove it on special teams. McIntosh is a great example. Kenny McIntosh had to play special teams last year. He came in knowing that. When I went down to his house in Pompano Beach last May to visit with Kenny and his family, and um, he knew who he was coming in behind. He knew that DeAndre Swift was there, and Zamir White was there, all that. And I told him two things. I said, two things, Kenny. I'm going to give you two pieces of advice that I've picked up quickly as the Georgia beat writer. Number one, I know you think it's hot down here in South Florida, but this heat that you're fixing to get in Athens is like nowhere else on the planet. I'm just telling you, you don't have any ocean insulation down there. It is going to be hotter than it has ever been in your life, and Kirby loves to practice in the heat. He is an absolute warrior when it comes to this, and those Georgia players are the toughest I have ever seen the way they practice in heat. And they take care of those guys. They don't have dehydration issues. They're very, they're very good about taking care of those guys, but they work in the heat more than any team I've ever seen. So that's number one, I told him. Number two, the way to Kirby Smart's heart is through special teams. He loves special teams. He believes in special teams. Kirby believes that's a winning edge. If there's an area of the Georgia football program that Kirby is absolutely not content with, it's his special teams. I don't think he's anywhere near happy with where he would like his special teams to be because he knows that's a winning edge. And that's what Kirby does, right? Kirby's the guy that outworks everybody, turns over every stone, and tries to beat you in every area that you're not working. And special teams is the third dimension. And games can be won or lost or turned, momentum gained and lost on special teams. If anything, he tries too hard on special teams. But he sells his players on it. He sells his players on the fact that when Georgia takes the field, they're going to leave it all out there. They're going to leave it out there with effort. They're going to leave it out there with hitting. They're going to leave it out there with play calling. And those plays that you practice, that fake field goal, that fake punt, Kirby's going to have the stones to call that play. And you know he's going to call it, so you work harder at it in practice. And if, if some people would have executed, then there might be another SEC championship right now. But some people weren't good at making decisions quickly. Um, anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, well, Dro Roman says don't put Zeus on special teams anymore. Uh, okay, high-risk guy, two knees now. But I don't blame Kirby at all for having Zamir White on special You know, Nick Chubb was on special teams, right? And Sonny Michelle. I don't blame him at all for that. Uh, now, it was frustrating at the time for Kirby. Uh, he was asked about it at a press conference. At that time, he was upset and hurt um, because he knew how much Zamir White had been through. Um, you know, Kirby's human. You've seen it. You've seen the emotion. He... Kirby Burns, man, he burns hot. There's there's a very there's a reality to this guy uh, at 44 years old. Um, eventually, he's going to have to mellow out, but I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, speaking of which, speaking of which, Nick Saban, did you see the PSA today with Nick Saban? I mean, the guy looks like he's getting younger every year. I know that Georgia fans and the rest of the SEC is just ready for Nick Saban to go away, but I don't think that's going to happen in the next couple few years. Um, I do think Kirby's going to outlast him. <laughs> I mean, Kirby's 44, Nick's, what, 68, 67, 69, something like that. Uh, but Saban looked great. It's like, what island did you go to? Where have you, I mean, when you make $9 million a year like Nick Saban, I, I guess, you know, maybe there's some fountain youth out there uh, in the middle of the ocean that he spends his time on. But he looked great in his interview. Uh, you would never guess that Nick Saban was in his late 60s. Um, he takes good care of himself. And he looks fired up. He does. He looked good. So uh, I think Nick Saban is back to be contended with. I, I don't. When I wrote a story about how I think one of the net effects, again, one of these unintended consequences that I talked about earlier. Someone says he's a cyborg. Is that you, William? Yeah. Um, one of the unintended. Con I, I think there will be some coaches that walk away, that don't come back from this, that spend the time with their family, that realize they've got the money in the bank, and say, you know what. I don't need this like I thought I needed it. 
Kirby Smart ain't going to be one of those guys. I can promise you that. Nick Saban ain't going to be one of those guys. I can promise you that. But I do think you'll see more guys, like we saw Chris Peterson at Washington, like we saw Bob Stoops at Oklahoma. I think you're going to see some coaches um, that are going to walk away uh, before this before this is over with. Um, that's kind of my take on that. Uh, what else we got here, guys? What else we got here? What else we want to talk about tonight on the beat? Uh, Shelton Tucker. We didn't recruit Carson Beck to sit the bench. Shelton, you didn't recruit anybody to sit the bench. They don't recruit anybody to sit the bench. Okay, it's like Dabo Sweeney said a couple years ago. Um, this was at the national championship game. I asked him because you know he had his quarterback transfer, uh, Kelly Bryant, transferred to Missouri, and they had Trevor Lawrence. And I said to Dabo, what do you do about this? He said, what do you mean what do I do about this? I'm not going to start recruiting backup quarterbacks. I'm going to keep recruiting starting quarterbacks. And you recruit starting quarterbacks, and they compete. And the best guy plays. And the next best guy gets the second most reps, and the third best guy waits his turn. Um, or not, right? So I was on the other night, Shelton. And uh, I'll, I'll pull this up again just for you, because everybody likes to throw Shelton's name out there. Car Shelton must be a big... Uh, Carson Beck fan, um, and, and Brian. Now he may not have to wait his turn. He just has to wait till he's the best quarterback. Because if Carson Beck's the best quarterback, he'll play this fall. I just think that it's a lot to ask of a high school freshman to come in and beat out a guy like Jamie Newman, who's six four two thirty, um, and a graduate transfer. You know, grown man versus young man. You know, to me. So I'm going to pull up the Kirby Smart comments from Destin in 2018. And uh, this is my little gold mine, right? I know you're, you guys are picking this up about me. I, I like my Kirby quotes. I like to go back and read the, read the book of Kirby um, because Kirby's very consistent. It, and, and for me as, as a sports writer that's covered a lot of, of uh, coaches, you know, coaches kind of, I don't want to say they walk, but they change, right? They evolve, and what they said one year may not be the same as they say two years later. <clears throat> but Kirby is very consistent in his beliefs. Um, and very consistent in his messages. So here's what Kirby said in Destin. This is 2018. So this is after Stetson Bennett has left the program. This is with Justin Fields and Jake Fromm on the team at the same time going into fall camp. Um, here's what he says. He says, uh, he, first he acknowledges that it's a me-now society. All the quarterbacks want to play right away. And quarterback is different than other positions except for kicker because you can only have one on the field, whereas other guys can play special teams, right? Um, you can rotate DBs in. You can rotate running backs in. Can't really do that with quarterbacks, although Kirby tried with Justin Fields. So here's, here's the money quote from Kirby. I would argue if you are a parent of a quarterback that you would say, you know what? Where is my son going to get the best development? Where is he going to get the best reps and learn to play the quarterback position like it is in the NFL? So in other words, do you want your kid to transfer somewhere else or do you want to wait and, and be maybe a one or a one and a half year, a two year starter at Georgia in a pro style system that the NFL respects or do you want to transfer somewhere else and maybe play in a system that, that maybe isn't as compatible with the NFL? And so what Kirby is saying there is basically uh, quality over quantity. And we saw that on defense last year, right? What they have, 37 guys on defense that played over 100 snaps. So when a lot of people are asking me or they're on Twitter and saying, man, how does Georgia keep landing the number one or number two class in the country? How do they keep getting these five stars when these guys know that they're not all going to play? Well, they know they're going to get an opportunity. That's how. And kids nowadays, it's not like, you know, it used to be, like, for example, at running back. Remember the old days when a running back would carry the ball between 20 and 35 times a game? It's not that way anymore, right? You're, you're seeing a lot more platooning. You're seeing a lot more specialization. That's true at most positions. Offensive lines now, um, ideally, offensive lines would go seven or eight deep. It, offensive line coaches want that. Sam Pittman did a nice job of building a, a unit. Remember, Cade Mays was at Swiss Army Knife. You could rotate guys in, keep them fresh. You see the way Kirby now on his D-line, he, you know, he wants eight to ten guys playing in that front. He's going to keep them fresh. He's going to keep throwing them bodies at you. Noel Smith didn't even start last year. He was the number one prospect overall in the country. He didn't even start, okay, because Aziz Ajilari was so good. But no one got his reps. Right? Jermaine Johnson was the number one JUCO player. He didn't start, I think he started two games. 
And he was the number one junior college player overall. But they're happy, and they stay because it's a group thing. It's a unit. It's a team. That's what Kirby's accomplished. He's got the buy-in. And as long as you've got the buy-in and everybody's pulling on the same end of the rope and pulling for each other, that's a good thing. And I think what I'm seeing with Nolan Smith doing the video last week, uh, with Eric Stokes cutting a video, with Monty Rice cutting a video, um, you know, the guys returning as leaders, Richard LeCounts coming back, Jamie Newman with the leadership he's going to bring from Wake, where they all just loved and revered this guy. Um, this is going to be a really good thing for Georgia folks. I'm telling you, not only just with that staff, with guys like Matt Luke and Scott Cochran, and, and I talk about Scott Sinclair and Charlton Warren. I know I sound like a broken record, but I've been doing this a long time, and this is one of the best coaching staffs I've ever been around. And I've been around national championship teams, and I've covered undefeated teams, both. And this staff measures up, and this talent is, is, is good. It's, it's on par with what I saw when, when Tennessee went undefeated in 98. And when I say that, don't take that lightly because they had like seven guys selected in the first two rounds of the 2000 draft, something stupid like that. Um, Georgetown is on par. Uh, I like what they got. I like what they got a lot, especially on defense. This defense is lights out. I got into a – and I try not to do this. I try not to do this. Um, I try not to argue with people on Twitter. I've tried to do a better job with that. I really have. I, you know, my boss has told me, you know, you're really – you're arguing with somebody with 15 followers. I'm like, why are you doing that? I know, I know, I know. But I, sometimes people say things and I just want to say, no, 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 no. Let me explain. So I've been in this – I wouldn't even call it an argument because that's too strong a word. But discussion with an Alabama fan that says, look at Alabama, boy, they got this quarterback. He's going to blow the doors off George. I said, dude, George's defense. If this guy, Mac, can't buy time with his feet, he's in trouble. You better have some mobility because Kirby's going to get you. You know, yeah, Jalen Hurts came off the bench and got him, but that was because the defensive end didn't know how to contain and we've, or outside linebacker, whatever you want to call him, outside linebacker, defensive end, three four, it's the same. The same guy lost containment that was losing containment earlier in the year, backup freshman at the time, now at Florida. Jalen Hurts killed him. That doesn't happen. If DeAndre Walker doesn't get injured, Georgia wins the 2018 SEC championship game. Take it to the bank. Take it to the bank. DeAndre Walker was having an MVP performance. All these close calls, the, the other fan bases, Oh, they're just excuses. I got, they're not excuses. They're just reasons. I'm just telling you what happened, right? It's like I used to cover NASCAR. Loved covering NASCAR. Great exposure. And how many times did Dale Earnhardt almost win the Daytona 500? You guys know who I'm talking about? Are there still some people that remember the black number three car? And every year I'd go to cover Daytona from 94 to 2009. But from 94 to 2001, the story every year, 94, excuse me, to, to 2000, it was when is Dale Earnhardt finally going to win the Daytona 500? I mean, Dale Earnhardt hit a seagull one time, and that's why he didn't win the Daytona 500. Another time he cut a tire. George just kind of had that Dale Earnhardt Daytona 500 look. Look, they just, they've been the best car. They've been there at the end, and something just happens. And it doesn't seem fair, and it's maddening. But you know what? When Dale Earnhardt finally won that Daytona 500, it was magical. And I'm so glad I was there to write about it. Um, it was just, it was a moment that literally brought tears to your eyes. Because here's this incredibly great driver, the Intimidator, who finally gets the big one. And I look at Georgia football as this incredible program. Um, you know, really what you want in a football slash academic environment slash campus slash town. I mean, if I were going to pick a campus and a football program to put in Epcot Center as College Football Town USA, it would be Georgia. I would pick up to Athens and Sanford Stadium, okay, not Jacksonville. I'd pick up Sanford Stadium and Athens and that campus and I'd lift it and I'd put it in Epcot Center and we'd call it College Football World. And because this is the epicenter for what you want. The campus, the stadium, the town, those three things right there together, if you're ranking on one to ten, you're not going to find another trio 
of campus, town, and stadium that beats Georgia. You're not. I've been all of them. Now Eugene was close. I liked Austin Stadium, but I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't like the campus as much. Right. Um, Alabama's got a great campus, but the stadium just. And Tuscaloosa is good, but not. You know. And you know. So you could go around, and you're just not going to find the combination of things that you got in Athens and Georgia. And so when Georgia wins it, and I think this is a year. Now, now things can happen. Players can get injured. Look, last year, for example, and I always bring this up. People go, oh, man, LSU, LSU. Look, LSU beat the odds. Joe Burrow staying healthy is was beating the odds, all right? But you lost Lawrence Cager. You lost DeAndre Swift. You weren't going to win a title with those two guys injured. For that matter, you lost Karis Jackson. You lost Dominic Blaylock. And you lost J.J. Holloman before the season started. That, you ain't going to win. That's bad luck. You got to stay healthy. What if, because what if, what if LSU lost their starting running back and one of their three receivers? Do they beat Clemson? What if Joe Burrow gets hurt? What if, what if he gets hurt like Tua did the year before and loses his mobility? What's Joe Burrow without mobility, right? So you got to have a little bit of luck. you got to have luck. But right now on paper, George is the team I pick. Um, you know, how many, what is this? How many days since we beat Alabama? Well, that would be September 19th, right? I think that's when that game is, Shelton. So I don't have a calendar count of what day of the year that is. Let me see, does my Google count? No, my Google calendar doesn't do that. How many days is it till September 19th? I'm not real sure. Um, a sketchy mat. That was not sketchy. That was a good analogy. The black number three was magical. When you turned on an NASCAR race, there were two questions. Who's winning and where's Earnhardt? And I wasn't even an Earnhardt fan, but I knew as a writer that if I wrote about... In fact, I go to an IROC luncheon. All right, here's an old sports writer story. People are like, look, I don't care about NASCAR, Mike. I'm going to tell you the story anyway. So Dale Earnhardt was not the best interview ever. I don't know if you saw earlier in the show, I was talking about Monty Rice being a man's man, saying what's on his mind. Well, that was kind of Dale Earnhardt, right? Dale didn't like to do a lot of interviews, but when Dale did do an interview, he was going to tell you what he thought. He just didn't do a lot. But the trick was to go to the IROC luncheon before the season started because Earnhardt loved IROC because he loved to mess with those IndyCar drivers. He would wreck them all. And that's what he did in IROC. Remember the identically prepared cars, all this stuff. So I would always be the first guy to show up. I'd sit at the Earnhardt table. There'd be eight chairs. I knew the trick. I'd be there. I wasn't going to talk to any other drivers. I was going to sit at the Dale Earnhardt table for the whole hour and 15 minutes and do all my Dale Earnhardt quotes and copy and all so I said to Dale Earnhardt, I said, you know, it's the darndest thing, Dale. Every time I write about you, I get more complaints and letters. And we would get letters back because NASCAR fans are passionate. That's why the sponsors loved it. I get more complaints, but then I get people that say I'm a fan. And he said, well, I'll tell you one thing. I guarantee you one thing if you write about me, Mike. People are going to read it. You know what? That's where Georgia football is, folks. And, and, and the Clemson fans can say what they want, and the Alabama fans can act all like they, they're not worried, and the Florida fans, but they're all watching. And they all know what Kirby Smart's doing. They see those recruiting rankings. They know how close Georgia's been. And they know that once Georgia clears that hill, that, that there is the potential for dynasty. Because of the in-state talent, because of the facilities, because of the fan base, because of the passion. You look at those TV ratings. And I'm not a big guy to always write about TV ratings, but Atlanta is on fire, right? We know that Birmingham and Knoxville are going to be top five in TV ratings every week for college football. But Atlanta is in the top three now. Atlanta is bought into the dogs. And when you got Atlanta unified about something, anything, right? Because all those years, all Atlanta fans, are the, they're not the worst. They just want a winner, okay? Braves fans are everywhere. Love the Braves fans. They're unified, okay? A little heartbroken, but unified. Dog fans are everywhere. You know, I, my, uh, my parents came down to visit me. And my mom, my mom, okay, listen, she's a senior citizen. I love her. She's, like, started to follow Georgia because she likes to read my stories. And um, so she follows Georgia football, and it's kind of fun to hear some of the questions she asks, right? But when she came down, she said, Michael, I swear every one of these houses has a cement bulldog on the doorstep. I said, you notice that, huh? 
So what's higher, the pickup trucks in the driveway or the bulldogs in front of the door? That's the question. I'm going to go with the bulldogs in front, especially uh, over here, uh, Oconee County and athens Clark County. If you don't have a bulldog in front of your door, there's got to be a bulldog somewhere. If there's not a bulldog, there's a G. And if there's not a bulldog, then there's not a G. And there's not something painted red or black. Your neighbors are going to get awful suspicious and wonder about you. I'm just going to tell you. Because in my neighborhood, there's bulldogs. And there's pickup trucks. And there's red and there's black and there's G's. And you can't escape it. You just can't get away from it. Wow, some of my stories. Uh, did I write the Brooklyn story? No, William, that's a Jeff Centel special. Um, William Gleaton. William, you don't like my comments about the bulldogs on the doorsteps? Man, you're a tough audience here. I'll tell you what. Well, all right. Well, it sounds like uh, William's had enough. Uh, Shelton says all high school players, freshmen, you don't think no court. No, no, Shelton. No, no, don't, don't mistake it. I think that high school freshmen, I think that Carson Beck would be fine as a starter. But if there's a better option, you're going to go with it. And I don't know that yet. I don't know that the competition hasn't played out. So let's wait and see. But I would say that if, if someone is 22 or 23 years old and is a grown man and has played college football and played at the, the, the speed and, 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 and has been in the training room and been through an offseason, they typically have a very big advantage physically. Now, from everything I'm hearing, Carson Beck is, is an outstanding player and an outstanding prospect. But you know what? So is Dwan Mathis. And Dwan is hungry. And Dwan is back from the skull surgery. And Dwan was set to be the quarterback of the future at The Ohio State. So um, there's a lot of talent in that room. And Stetson Bennett as well. So I guess I'll finish on that note. I talked a lot more about NASCAR and Cement Bulldogs than I ever thought I would in one chat. Um, I want to thank Ingles again. Um, I appreciate my sponsor. They, you know, Your neighborhood Ingles is what brings uh, this to you every Tuesday. Again, if you missed the, uh, the public service announcement here, Ingles is hiring both short-term and long-term. Uh, they do their interviews on Thursdays, Tuesday, Tuesdays and Thursdays from 2 to 4. If you go to the Ingalls website, uh, click on the careers page, and you can get an application. Um, and also be aware, Ingalls opens 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. and from 7 to 8, um, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, uh, dedicated to those senior shoppers and those with the compromised immune systems. Um, so uh, be aware of that. Everybody, have a safe and wonderful Tuesday night. It's been a blast talking to you. I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, tomorrow night will be Centel's Intel. Jeff will be coming live uh, on this same uh, bat channel. So have a good one, everybody.